Coach, how important is it for you to follow up a big weekend like last weekend with the with the performance at home this week against your rivals? Does it mean more, or how should I say this? I mean, does it? Do you feel as though you need to have a good performance against Washington for last weekend to mean something? It doesn't matter who we're playing. We need a good performance. I mean, Washington is our next game, but it could be CU, Stanford. Um, we struggle with both uh, CU on the road and Stanford here. It could be them. It could be CU, Utah, I should say, coming in next week or something like that. It doesn't matter. We just got to string together some wins. So it's just important for us to play well regardless of who is there. It just so happens that it's, it's, it's UW and as we start the second half of the season. And then last time in Seattle, it was the first Pac-12 game on the road, no less, with seven newcomers. Rowe wouldn't play, like you played, yet yeah, you played them tough for 25 minutes. Just having him back this weekend, I mean, what does that do for you and your team confidence-wise? You know, uh, it gives us a chance to play a lot better basketball, I'll put it that way, because um, they are a very good team and they're very well coached. Their defense travels with them. And they've been in pressure pack games. They've got a lot of experience over there. So the fact that we've been through some gains and gained some more experience is a good thing. But you still have got to really play well. You have to play well to beat them because they're, they're not going to beat themselves. They're a very good team. A team like yours that just thrives in transition offense and then when the outside shots are falling, what's the best way for you to attack that 2-3 zone that they've patented? You know, I'm always amazed at the media people who want you to give your scouting plan Three days before game time, I said, what we're going to do and the best way to do that. Coach Hopkins is a very, very good coach, as he's proven and everything. He needs no help from Coach Kent in figuring that out. But, you know, there's not much more I need to say on it outside of the fact that we've got a work cut out for us in a lot of areas. Uh, so they're averaging about nine steals, 16 turnovers a game. Uh, so what's kind of like your plan to limit the, the, the turnovers that they create and the opportunities that they create uh, to score on those turnovers? First of all, just don't turn the ball over. You're not going to limit. If you're turning the ball over up top, they're going to score, and that's been one of the things that's been a factor with us in when we had our, our losing streak is, to, is to turn the ball over too much. Now, we've settled down do a much better job of it, but you just can't do it. You've got to take care of the ball against the team that really feast off turnovers. Beyonce, yesterday when we were talking to him, he acknowledged that any time you play a rival like Washington, especially with him being a Seattle kid, it is a little bit personal. In your experience as a coach, when it's a rivalry game like this week, is it better to acknowledge and harness the emotion that comes along with it rather than shove it under the carpet? <coughs> you know, um, um, in, in the old days, when, when rivalries were really rival games and everything, uh, they were so doggone competitive. And in this day and age, when players with AAU basketball, and everybody competing against each other every summer. And some of these guys playing on the same team and they know each other during the summers before they come to college. Uh, it's a huge rival for the fans still there because of the history and all that. It's a rival for the players too. And I think the thing is, when you have games of, of this magnitude, you, you don't worry so much. It, it's about playing, who, who, who shows up to play, who has their energy, who has their focus, and all of those things that make the rival games what they are. And um, They've had their opportunity to beat us a few times when we've not had our focus there. And if we don't have our focus there this time, they're going to beat us this time. So we need to make sure we have our focus where it needs to be. Jazz Kuhn just played his best basketball this season over these past three games. At the same time, it seems like this team has really started to turn a corner. Is there a coincidence there? Is there something to be said for that as well? You know, I think with us having the opportunity um, – uh, to play a lot of guys, I think with an opportunity at times to get longer on the floor, uh, it has certainly helped us. But I think also it's just a competitive nature of practices that have happened with the guys like Jazz uh, and Marvin, uh, Gervais, uh, Ahmed. They're starting to figure some things out. So the practices have become extremely competitive, and practices will, will hold you accountable uh, to minutes and rotations and everything else because they really get after each other, and they prepare us for the games as well too. So uh, as he gets better, uh, the program will get better because the practices will get better, the competition will get better, and consequently uh, everybody will lift their game up to another level. I know you were happiest for your players after the Arizona wins, but just for you as a coach too, losing 11 of 12 is is tough for everyone. What did that do for you after those games just to, to see everything come together like that? You know, we've been on a, a, a just a, a, a tear in terms of my staff. And, you know, regardless of what, 
what's on the peripheral, we, we really focus as to what's in here. And we've said all along we knew we were close, we're close, we're close. We had to just keep coaching and, and teaching and staying positive with them, uh, even in the midst of your, your deepest, darkest adversity uh, of a season. So it, it just – it, when they break through like that and have those breakthrough game, breakthrough weekend, you know, the, the satisfactory comes from seeing their joy in the locker room and for us, for them to have hung in there with us and everything because we knew they had the ability uh, to play well and get there. Now uh, it has to continue, and particularly coming back home and being able to do it and continue to play at that level uh, the rest of this, this season, particularly second half of the conference, and you start to play people again. So there's a joy there, but yet at the same time, there's so much more work to be done. The worst thing that can happen to us is walking up to this arena. People are still patting those guys on the back and telling them you did a good job, Arizona, Arizona State, with, with you dubbed down on the floor warming up. That's the worst thing that could happen to us because the, the focus to play an opponent like that has to be huge. And that we're in the area of transferring, but just if this team stays together over these next two or three years with all the young players and pieces that you have already here coming in, what does that get you thinking about the future potentially for this program? You know, recruiting is the lifeline for, for any program. And, and regardless of what anybody else uh, thinks about your, your recruiting, you recruit pieces that fit your coaching style, you recruit pieces that fit your college community, and you recruit pieces that fit your system. And when you look at uh, CJ and, and Marvin, uh, Jazz, A2 Gervais, and them, you know, that, that's a really good nucleus of players that are sitting there. And what we have coming the door is going to add to that. And, and we still have a piece to go and get. So uh, I feel really confident that we're heading in a real positive direction. It's taken us some time to get the recruiting in place. But in this day and age of transferring, uh, the most important piece is for those kids to stay put, give it time, change their bodies, because they certainly have – uh, the games to do it. If their bodies can continue to develop, uh, you've got some players here that could really be outstanding in this conference. All right, do you have some people on the phone? <coughs> Anyone on the phone? Yeah, AJ, AJ. Okay, I was like, I heard Theo. Okay. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask about CJ. Obviously, Rebel got a lot of the headlines of games last week, but when you look at CJ's stat line, uh, 13 assists and almost triple double in that first game, can you talk about his impact on, on you guys when he's not scoring as much? No, I, I think CJ is just having a terrific freshman season. I mean, it's just it's very abnormal for a freshman to to play that well. And in his case, when he's not scoring, there's still so many more things he can do to impact the game. Uh, his defense, his shot blocking ability, his toughness, his rebounding, uh, his ability to push the pace with the ball, his ability to find people uh, in transition, find them in the half court. Uh, he has a high basketball IQ, and, and probably the biggest thing is his, his competitiveness is contagious. He, he's a very competitive player, so there's a lot more that he does and brings to the table besides scoring that makes him very unique and has given him the opportunity to have such a good impact his freshman year. Can you, can you tell me someone who's been around the game a long time with, obviously, with, with, with dad playing for Collins? That's kind of a fiction in the Seattle uh, basketball scene and just the way that the, the way that he treats the game and approaches the game, kind of the maturity he has as a, as a freshman. Can you tell that he's been around it for, for basically his whole life? No question, but I think um, if you look at Seattle basketball, and you start looking at all those great players that have that have come out and played over at UW and are now sitting in the NBA. Uh, I don't know if they had the same impact, but they were certainly highly recruited coming out of high school, and you knew they were going to have an impact. So it's it's a, it's some great players over in Seattle. Even today, there's players over there, and that's why it's so important for somebody like us, Robert Franks and Beyond. Even though they're from Tacoma and Vancouver, and then here comes CJ from Seattle. Still, you got players that are coming from that close of a distance that are starting to have uh, tremendous success over here in the system and everything. So it's it's big, and it's important. But it's also because their their high school basketball is good over there. Their AAU basketball is really sound over there. Uh, they have good people in place to help develop those kids at an early age. And it's such a competitive environment playing in that league over there. Extremely competitive that by the time they get to college, they're already groomed to know how hard you have to play, how to compete, and how to play tough. And, and that's a tribute to those coaches and that, that environment that they grow up in over there in terms of basketball. And see, see this 
kind of the direct example of someone who was offered by, by the Huskies and still kind of shows you guys. Are, I know a lot of the guys that, that you have there right now they didn't have the opportunity to, to play for you, Dad, and that, that's why kind of the rivalry intensifies it every year. Can, can you talk about that that aspect of it and why it's important to, to kind of have guys like that, you know, finally choosing choosing you guys over them? And do you think CJ can kind of set a trend, maybe? You know, I certainly hope he can, uh, because I think uh, both of these are, are excellent programs. Theirs just have to be sitting there in the city and everything else, and we're sitting over here. But they both have the opportunity to be extremely successful basketball programs. They're outstanding institutions. Uh, you can see where our football is successful, our soccer programs, our volleyball programs are successful. Uh, you're rowing. You've got a baseball team just teetering on bursting out and being successful as well, too. So we've proven that academically outstanding. You got your medical school now. You got sports that are having success over here. You got a president that's reintegrated and invigorated our community over here, as well as our athletic director. So there is no reason why you can't have that basketball success and have it at both institutions. And now all of a sudden, you get players in the Northwest. You've got Washington, you got Gonzaga, and you got a Washington State. That's that's important that the, the power structure is shifting. And is that Gonzaga's always had it. UW has had it the last couple of years. And, and we're kind of that school that's been teetering with it. If we can have success ourselves, then it, it, it just impacts so much stuff in terms of uh, just recruiting and, and support and all of those things that we need. That's kind of the final piece for us. I think one more about CJ. A few times on, on, on the uh, on the Pactual Network broadcast, a few a few announcers have kind of compared him to, to Maine and Ginobili. I was wondering which which you kind of make of that comparison, and uh, I guess is, is, is there anyone else that, that you see maybe the NBA or across the college landscape or someone else that you've coached that, that you kind of compare his game to? He has bigger hair than Ginobili. That would be a big difference between the two. Makes him a little bit taller than Ginobili, too. He might cut it off. He might be a little bit shorter, I understand. But still, I think CJ's bigger. Uh, I think he's um, uh, a little bit more athletic. But Ginobili is one of the greatest players to play the game uh, coming from Europe and, and, and making such an impact in the NBA for so many years. Uh, that may not be a fair thing to say that he's at Ginobili status and all that. That's, that's not him yet. But I think in CJ's case, the thing that I say that will separate CJ – uh, to be what I would call a great player, is his ability when he buys in and really understands how he can impact the game on the defensive end of the floor. Because he's a unique player that he understands the game, he has athleticism, he has instincts, he can block shots, he can make steals, he gets in the passing lanes, he's tough. When he understands how to take all of those things and dominate the defensive end, like sometimes he can get going on offense, then he's going to separate himself and be one of the better players to ever come out of this conference, I feel. Uh, so speaking of dominating on defense, uh, 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 the Huskies they got three uh, three players averaging uh, double figure scoring. Uh, I think they're averaging about 15, 16, 17 points a game. Uh, kind of, uh, what, what's kind of the game plan for uh, being more aggressive uh, on defense to kind of stop the the piling up of points and whatnot? Both teams are going to play hard. Oh, it's just a joke. Actually, if we don't play defense, we're not going to win the game. If we can't slow them down and contain some things, um, we gave up a lot over there, and they really took advantage of it and shot the ball extremely well in their environment. So a big emphasis of ours has been on our defense. We, we've got to play defense. We, we know how much better it makes our offense. We, we know the success we can have when we play defense. Uh, we've seen a blueprint of that this past weekend that I'm hoping will carry over uh, here at home with all of our, our students in, in, in the arena and everything. We can get that energy level uh, anywhere close to what we saw down in Arizona State. I think it's difficult to, to duplicate 12,000 plus in Arizona, but if we can get anything close to what we saw at Arizona State, that will help our defense because it will allow us uh, to play with more energy. And, and sometimes that puts more pressure on your opponents too to know they have to come in there now and there's a crowd and noise and energy sitting in the building as well. So I'm hoping those things all come to fruition for us that our students are there, our energy is there, our defense is there, their energy is there in terms of the students too, and, and we kind of will feed off of each other throughout the course of the game. Yeah, do you think uh, the bad roads on the way back to the west side and the long weekend is going to maybe uh, draw more of a crowd this weekend, especially with it being a rivalry game? I, I just hope the fact that, um, you know, it's been a long haul for us, long haul for me here and that too, and I think um, – uh, the, the ingredient missing is obviously having a success, and we've had a little bit of success. We got a lot more basketball uh, to play with, with seven games, five of the seven of them here, and in a conference tournament sitting there. And any 
uh, success from this point on. Uh, really will, will be enhanced if the students can get into the arena and help us. They can help us on defense. They can help us in transition. They can help us on offense with their confidence and everything. So they just become a big part of it. So with, with the snow here and the roads clear and only two or three blocks to come to the arena, I, I'm hoping they can make their way here, those students that are still here uh, on campus and everything. So, so certainly Mother Nature would play a part in helping us this time around uh, being here in Pullman.